I want to welcome everyone to Vito Marcantonio, Champion for Civil Rights, which is sponsored by the Vito Marcantonio Forum. My name is Gil Fagiani, and I'm going to be a chairperson. Just going to remind people if they could turn off their <coughs> cell phones and other electronic devices. The Vito Marcantonio Forum is an historical, cultural, and educational organization that brings together people from a wide variety of backgrounds interested in disseminating and sharing knowledge of the life and work of Vito Marcantonio. A protege of Fiorello LaGuardia, Marcantonio was the most electoral, electorally successful radical American politician of the 20th century. He served as congressman from East Holland for 14 years, 1934 to 1936, and 1938 to 1950. Critical to his, to his success was his unique multi-ethnic coalition of Italians, Puerto Ricans, and African Americans. Today's presentation marks the, marks the Vito Marcantonio Forum's 14th public event since it reconstituted itself on October 11, 2011. Activities the forum is sponsored include a celebration of the fourth printing of Professor Joe Miles Meyer's book, Vito Marcantonio, Radical Politician, 1902 to 1954. That was at, on October 27, 2011 at the Breck Forum. This is Joe Meyer in person here. His Vito book is also. Yes, it yes. is. <laughs> Just in time. Indeed, it is. Uh, Another event was the naming of a conference room at Austin's Community College after Marc Antonio at the behest of Professor Meyer on April 25, 2012. We sponsored a special tribute, Vito Marc Antonio and the Puerto Rican People, Solidarity in Progress, on November 28, 2012, attended by more than 100 people at the Center for uh, Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. We also sponsored the panel, Vito Marcantonio, spokesperson for the left on, in 2013 here at the annual left forum, which was held out here at Pace University. With the goal of ensuring, Vito Marcantonio, ensuring the Vito Marcantonio Forum would become a fully integrated nonprofit organization, the forum held a fundraiser to celebrate our second anniversary, anniversary at Gaetana's Cucina Italiana on Christopher Street in Greenwich Village, November uh, 3rd, 2013. On February 22nd, 2014, at the Mulberry Street Library, Public Library, the forum presented a book party, dramatic reading and discussion of The Heart is the Teacher by Leonard Covello, who was a teacher, educational theorist, longtime East Harlem resident and activist, and one of the most important historical figures in the Italian-American community in the 20th century. He was also a mentor and close friend of Mark Antonio's. On May 10, 2014, the forum, along with the Italian-American Writers Association, sponsored a book lecture with slides of Simone Cinotto's The Italian-American Table, Food, Family, and Community in New York City at the Public Street, Mulberry Public Street Library. On August of last year, August 9th, the, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of Vito Marcantonio's death. Seventy people gathered at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx to celebrate his life. To further his memory, Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz and New York City Council Member and Speaker Melissa Mark Beverito attended and sponsored a proclamation naming August 9th as Vito Marcantonio Day in the Bronx. They also committed themselves to work with us to name a street after Vito Marcantonio. On October 19th of last year, at Gaetana's Cucina Italiana, the Forum and the Drama Workshop Project sponsored the Vito Marcantonio Phenomena, a theatrical reconstruction of Congressman Vito Marcantonio's radical le legacy dedicated to our late VMF founder, Morgan Powell. And then in celebration of Black History Month, the Vito Marcantonio Forum sponsored a talk, East Harlem's African American Community by Chris Bell, author of East Harlem Remembered Oral Histories of Community and Diversity on February 28th of this year at the Mulberry Street Library. At the same location on May 14th of this year, in celebration of Labor History Month, we sponsored a presentation by Gerald Meyer on the American Labor Party, 1936 to 1954, 
with dramatizations by Roberto Ragoni and Art Bernal. And finally, on Saturday, May 9th, 9th of this year, at the Cornelius Street Cafe, the Vito Marcantonio Forum, and the Italian American Writers Association featured two VMF founders, Stephen Siciliano, who read from his latest novel manuscript, The, Go the Good Father, that tells the life story of radical Congressman Vito Marcantonio through the eyes of a neighboring family, and yours truly, Gil Fagiani, who read from his collection of poetry set in East Harlem, a Blanquito in El Barrio. Today's program focuses on Congressman Vito Marcantonio's pioneering and largely unacknowledged support for civil rights. Historian Thaddeus Russell has described Marcantonio as one of the greatest champions of black civil rights during the 1930s and 1940s. Marcantonio sponsored bills to prohibit the poll tax used by southern states to disenfranchise poor workers and to make lynching a federal crime. In 1949, Madden Clayton Powell Jr. called Marc Antonio the most consistent and steadfast friend of the Negro and Puerto Rican people in Congress, barring none. Before I turn the program over to our first presenter, I want to read my poem, Litany of San Vito, from my book, A Blanquito in El Barrio, which has become a tradition at our, our events. I would like to remind people there are books for sale today that relate to today's program, including Vito Marcantonio, Radical Politician, by Professor Gerald Meyer. I Vote My Conscience, which is a collection of Mar uh, Marcantonio's speeches, speeches by Annette Rubenstein, and my, set, and my book set in East Harlem, a Blanquito in El Barrio. Litany of San Vito to Congressman Vito Marcantonio. San Vito of East Harlem, pray for us. San Vito, bread of the poor, pray for us. San Vito, crucified by Wall Street, pray for us. San Vito, martyr of Mar McCarthyism, pray for us. From the jail cell walls, San Vito, deliver us. From the backyard trap game, San Vito, deliver us. From the lone shark's vig, San Vito, deliver us. From the drunken stupor, San Vito, deliver us. From TB and asthma, San Vito, protect us. From the social workers vita, visit, San Vito protect us. From immigration raids, San Vito protect us. From the landlord's greed, San Vito protect us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, introduce our first presenter, Roberto Ragone, co-chair co of the Vito Marcantonio Forum, has over 25 years experience in New York State and local government and nonprofits working in education, criminal justice, urban infrastructure, and arts and culture. As an analyst, administrator, and advocate, Ragone has worked at Dewitt Clinton High School, the City Council, Mayor's Office, and State Senate. As a consultant, he now focuses on marketing, public relations, and strategic planning for businesses, nonprofits, and arts-related projects. And Roberto is going to do three dramatizations. But first, I'm going to do a presentation. Okay. Right. Exactly. So. Right. So, um, so I'm I'm going to tackle on this topic of uh, Vito Marcantonio and civil rights, and then we're going to do um, eight minutes of dra I'm going to do eight minutes of dramatization that uh, Gil is going to introduce. So, um, welcome, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, so, you know, I did, it, I did this presentation. We did a panel on Vito Marcantonio two years ago. And I, and uh, Jerry focused on foreign policy, I focused on civil rights. I thought about how can I make this a little bit different, right? At least the, the setup, at the very least, right? So, um, without going into detail, there was a series of coincidences where Vito Marcantonio kept reoccurring in my life to the point where I... I, I read Gerald Meyer's book and I said, this has to be my mission. My mission found me, right? So, uh, but, and a lot of people know about those coincidences, it, and I won't go into them today, but one of the other coincidences that is more directly related to civil rights is that when I was in college, I, I, f I majored in American history, I focused on um, 19th century American history. So I take this one course, and John Quincy Adams emerges as an important figure, as a congressman after he had become a one-term president, right? Fights for the right to preserve the right to petition, right, to petition against slavery, right? Takes the, 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 the legal case 
defending the slaves on the Amistad ship, right, takes on the case of defending the, the Native Americans in the Everglades, which he won the case, according to John Marshall, but then Andrew Jackson says, Justice John Marshall has made his decision, let's see him enforce it. But fascinating, right? So then, uh, uh, then fast forward Thaddeus Stevens, right? Thaddeus Stevens, congressman, radical Republican, champions the end of slavery, uncompromising, champions the economic rights of the freed slave, comes up with the term 40 acres and a mule, right? And comparisons begin with John Quincy Adams, right? So I had taken a course about Civil War and Thaddeus Stevens comes up. So there's this other set of coincidences <laughs> forming. Now, you know how everything comes in threes? Like, you know, in your life, two celebrities die, and then all your friends are waiting for the third shoe to drop, like, you know, like, like that, right? So in this case, like, things come in threes in many ways, right? So John Quincy Adams, Thaddeus Stevens, right? So I, I wasn't thinking in, in threes, but I take an African-American history class in my senior year, African-American history class, and the name briefly comes up of Vito Marcantonio, and uh, you know, advocating for civil rights, and and then later when I read Jerry Meyer's book and other information, Paul Robeson, at his um, in a eulogy to Mark Antonio when he dies, um, that he publishes in his book but never got to directly say, calls Mark Antonio, the Thaddeus Stevens of the first half of the 20th century. Right, so. Thaddeus to Quincy Adams, Mark Antonio to Thaddeus, right? So it's just, it's fascinating. And I wanna, I wanna begin the presentation and end that, the presentation later on in my presentation, symmetrically, making, making a point about those three. But, so Mark Antonio comes along, right? And his, his civil rights is part of a trifecta that included civil liberties and economic opportunity. And civil rights, was advocated for in terms of voting rights legislation, anti-lynching legislation, anti-discrimination laws, and desegregation, right? Some of the things that we associate with the 60s, but in some ways he was a precursor in the 30s and 40s, right? So what, 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 was, this, what was the goal for all this? They were a means of empowering lower and moderate income whites, immigrants, and African Americans to elect representatives who favor and will be held accountable for protecting civil liberties so people can have the freedom to speak out against political and economic injustice, passing public policy that provides economic opportunity for the underdogs, the poor, the minorities, immigrants, laborers, union workers, fixing a shortcoming in the abstract vision set forth in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Emancipation Proclamation, and even the Bible because Mark Antonio and LaGuardia would invoke, you know, the Prince of Peace, and, and the, um, the Sermon on the Mount was a big one, right? So um, that all men are, are equal in the eyes of God, in God's image, right? And then the, the other goal is to, is, to, is to put forth that America, that mainstream America, should recognize the importance of the role of loyal Americans of all backgrounds in peace and war, since this is also encompassing the period of, of World War II. Right, so now, let's, we could break this down into periods of time. So there's the, he's, he enters Congress, you know, after getting, after being the campaign manager for LaGuardia and getting LaGuardia into, into the mayoralty, he says, well, I'm gonna run for your congressional seat, right? So he runs, he wins in 34, and then in the 1930s, Roosevelt is in office, we have the New Deal, so what is his civil rights um, um, advocacy in the 1930s, right? So Mark Antonio and the emerging American Labor Party, which is the third party that wants to vote for Roosevelt but doesn't want to click the Democratic Party ticket uh, because they're more left of center, they, they, they seek together, Mark Antonio and ALP, to ensure that the Works Progress <laughs> Administration hires were done without regard to race. Then Mark Antonio specifically proposes legislation to include domestic servants under social security laws and migrant workers under the wage and hours law. 
And these efforts implied an interest in the well-being of African Americans. Because think about it, 1930s, post-World War I migration of African Americans to the northern cities, right? So that's the 1930s. 1940, war period, 1940, 41, there's a war, but we haven't intervened yet, right? So as America uh, edges closest to, closer to war, he sees World War II as an important backdrop that should pressure for action on civil rights. So in March of 1941, he, he emerges as one of the leading spokespersons for African Americans. So he advocates for a measure to prohibit discrimination because of race, color, or creed by any agency supported by federal government funds. Right? So it's, it's non-discrimination, you know, where we're, we're, we're doing lend-lease, whatever we're doing to help the British at this point, right? So, you know, let's not discriminate against our people, right? And part of this was a motive. Everybody knows that Mark Antonio was left of Roosevelt, left of the New Deal, and at that point, pre-World War II, he was, he was critiquing the Roosevelt administration. He was being, in some ways, he was called a gadfly, but he was really sticking it to him for not being, um, you know, radical enough. But even more so, when, when we start supporting the British, right, basically his advocacy is part of a motive, something to embarrass the administration about the war, especially because Mark Antonio believed that the funding, funding that war had imperialistic motives, that the war itself had imperialistic motives. Everybody's trying to hold on to their colonies, right, including the British, right? And it's coming at the expense of the New Deal. The New Deal is beginning to be defunded for the war. So, if you're, so his, his attitude is, if you're going to express high-minded ideals for supporting the British and Churchill while Hitler is bombing London, then you, know, you, may, you should do justice for African Americans and other people, right? So now, there's the war period now. American intervention, 1942, you know, December 1941, 42 to 45. America's at war. He expresses this irony about our participation in the war and how we are in our own backyard even more starkly. So he basically asks the question, and some of this is paraphrasing, some of this is not direct quotes, but can you reconcile a world fighting against fascism or Nazi ideology that is race-based with the discrimination laws currently on the books in the United States, right? And it's a message that he's conveying domestically about the rights of our own people, right, African Americans and immigrants and so on, right? But it's also a message that he's trying to convey globally, including to, and this is a direct, direct quote, the colonial peoples in India, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean of our resolve for a free and democratic world, unquote. Now, part of this, again, the war backdrop is the military strategy argument. You know, we're, we're sending men to war. We're sending African Americans to war. We're sending uh, immigrants to this country to war on our side, in our, in our armies, in our navies, and so on, right? So one argument is we need to boost the morale of 13 million loyal African Americans by showing their contribution is appreciated and will be reciprocated with justice, fairness, and equality. And then this is particularly true for African Americans because at least Prior to Pearl Harbor, many African Americans were viewed, prior to Pearl Harbor, they viewed World War II just a white man's war. Just a white man's war, imperialist, same old story, right? The other, the other irony about the, at the invocation and advocacy for African Americans in this context is that perhaps the first man to die at Pearl Harbor was African American Dory Miller of Texas who uh, Mark Antonio acknowledged, I think in a letter to the family, and uh, maybe a letter to Roosevelt, I don't remember exactly, and in a, in a, I think in a ceremony of some kind in Harlem, right? Because I don't, think, I don't think the people of Texas at that point would have welcomed him to Texas to honor Dory Miller, right? So, um, but also, uh, but also, in, and this is uh, one thing I just want to uh, say this of note, you know, and there's, you know, there's the advocacy for Puerto Ricans, which, you know, I think Jerry will talk about more than I will in this, this part of the presentation. But in this context, there's also the, ad the advocacy for uh, Italian Americans, right? So in July 1942, he says, you know, and this is not a direct quote, but it's, he's basically saying, some of it is this, paraphrasing, but uh, basically saying is that if, if we discriminate against Italian Americans based on the, the, their surnames to participate uh, in the in the war, like 
to get jobs in the defense industries, right? To, in the, to, 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 uh, to fight this war against Hitler. Then you are playing Hitler's game in America. There was a speech where he, he repeats that refrain. And he says, you're no different than some, some Berlin, some saboteur smuggled in from Berlin. And he says that this, you're preventing the full mobilization against the, uh, the, the Axis power. And you, therefore, are un-American. Right? So that's, that's all part of the, of the uh, you know, using the war as a prism for civil rights, right? Um, then, uh, Mark Antonio even more clearly uh, demonstrates his commitment in 1942 to civil rights and the plight of African Americans by sponsoring anti-lynching legislation that would make lynchings a federal crime, okay? Now, here's, here's where the story continues, and I... I this is, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna inject an Arsenio Hall moment. Remember like the old Arsenio Hall show where it's like, things that make you wanna go, huh, right? So I'm like, I'm just trying to be cross-referential here, right? So the, um, now a few years ago, if you remember, the United States Senate, if I'm remembering this correctly, officially apologized to African Americans, right? for, uh, because of, I guess, the way they filibustered, the way they prevented and delayed <coughs> civil rights legislation, right? So the interesting Arsenio Hall question would be, why, why, technically, did the House of Representatives not owe an apology to the, Af the African Americans? Why did the Senate owe the apology, but not the House of Representatives, right? <coughs> and that is because, repre huh, right, okay. So, <laughs> Representative, <laughs> Representative Lee Geyer of California in early 1942 um, uh, introduces legislation for the anti-poll tax legislation. Um, but in mid-year, he dies. He dies. Now, this is the end. This is the second half of a two-year congressional section, right? It's an election year. It's the second year of a two-year cycle. So Mark Antonio fills the leadership vacuum. He pursues and persistently collects 218 signatures for a discharge petition is what it's called to take the bill out of the Judiciary Committee so it passes the House of Representatives for the first time in history. First time in history. And which is, it's really, you have to understand that's a remarkable accomplishment, right? So, um, so it passed the House. It didn't, it never passed the Senate, but it passed the House, right? So Mark Antonio's unprecedented <coughs> passage of the anti-poll tax legislation from the House incited public hatred by Southern congressmen. It passed in, a, in October 1942, so you have to think about this. There's three months left in the cycle. How much lag time do you really have? So because it was a little over two months before the congressional session ends, and with concerns over war measures, um, and the you know, Southern Senators chairing committees, um, and as part of a filibuster, the bill dies in the Senate, okay? So then Mark Antonio then, first he jump starts introducing the bill in the new congressional session. So it's January 1943, he introduces the anti-poll tax legislation. So you got like a whole two, two year cycle to work with, right? Boom, he hits the ground running. January 15, 1943. So now on that date, if he, was, he, if he wasn't already a, uh, a national figure, and he would become a national figure, an international figure, but if he wasn't yet at that point, then something happens on that date that completely catalyzes uh, that uh, notoriety. Um, it, um, it made him a cause celeb. Uh, the Democratic leadership of the House, because uh, perhaps maybe at the request of the, the Roosevelt administration, uh, designated Mark Antonio to become chairman of the Judiciary Committee, right? Which would have let him be able to get these civil rights bills out of the out of the out of committee uh, sooner to uh, to for for uh, a full vote of, of the House, right? So the Southern congressmen revolt. They're seething in uh, Speaker of the House Sam Rayburn's office. They're like piling in there. Like, I have this image of, like, remember the 1950s, everybody piling into a phone booth, right? They're all piling into Sam Rayburn's office to go, what the hell is this, right? So the, um, the, uh, the Republicans and the summer, Southern Democrats did prevent Mark Antonio's appointment to the Judiciary Committee. And you could see, by the way, with the Republican participation, it's all part of the end of the association 
of the Republican Party with the party of Lincoln, right? So this process is happening beginning with Roosevelt, right? So, uh, and so, so the, here's the interesting politics here. The Democrats have a narrow margin in the House. That, and that narrow margin is with these Southern, uh, these Southern congressmen, many of them chairing committees, that could swing other way, either way. They could be like voting with the Republicans. So basically, the Democrats, the Roosevelt administration is to some extent feeling as though they got to um, um, cater to them, right, in order to hold on to a thin majority to get measures passed, you know, in, uh, for the war measures or to the extent that, uh, that any elements of the New Deal are still uh, intact. Um, so, um, so Mark Antonio's commitment only heightened as a result of his rejection from the Judiciary Committee. So there was a political strategy argument that he puts forth that, you know, that complements the moral philosophical argument. He notes that the Southern politicians, some of them from the, poll, from the poll tax states, some of them are chairing these congressional committees. They're opposing civil rights. They're opposing union organizing. Aid to families of soldiers in war, right? So everybody's gung-ho about war, but aid to, and other progressive causes. They're cutting the New Deal, uh, and they're favoring, they're favoring war against Nazism, but opposing legis legislation that would prohibit discrimination in employment even in the war industries, right? So um, in February of 1943, he lays out the political argument in a radio speech, laying out the implications of the, of the, of the poll tax. He says, look, in the eight remaining poll tax states, citizens must pay for the privilege of voting. Voter turnout in poll tax districts is 2,000, <laughs> just 2,000 with small margins of victories, whereas in districts without the poll tax, 40,000 to 500,000 people. Did you see that contract? 2,000 versus 40,000 to 500,000. So there's a disenfranchisement, therefore, there's a disenfranchisement of nearly 10 million adult voters, uh, about 6 million of whom are poor whites in the South, and approximately 4 million are African Americans. Therefore, he would see, quote, he said, therefore, quote, you can readily see that Undemocratic elections make for undemocratic representation. Undemocratic <coughs> representation makes for repressive and reactionary legislation. And you know, this got me thinking, but given this reality that even the poor whites are disenfranchised, I asked myself, you know, one year after Mark Antonio's death, how many poor white Southerners were still disenfranchised from voting at the time that Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus, right? So. Food for thought, right? Uh, so in, in May 1943, legislation was passed in the House. Uh, so he passes the legislation, the anti poll tax legislation in the House uh, in May. Uh, so, uh, uh, so again, he's got, he's got a lot more, uh, he's got, what is it, 19 months, 19 months to, to try to get that passed the Senate compared to the previous session when it was like very late in the session, right? So, um, so, but that for some reason, the, the, the bill doesn't get to the Senate for a whole year. Some senators uh, opposed uh, the bill, uh, were obsessed by the fact that Mark Antonio had sponsored the bill, and they, and they filibustered the bill, and even a, a Senator uh, uh, Eastland said he would offer a thousand amendments. At the end of the day, you know, he, he, he tried to get legislation passed throughout that period of time. In 1945, he uh, was, um, you know, he, he, the clock started to tick on Mark Antonio because the war was ending. Roosevelt uh, uh, had passed away. So um, the, at some point, the, um, you know, the McCarthyism was, uh, was rising. Uh, Pre-McCarthyism, -Mar pre McCarthyism was rising with the, the, the rise of Richard Nixon and the red baiting. So, um, so Mark Antonio basically uh, focused on uh, passing um, some, of the, some of the credit to Adam Clayton Powell. So Adam Clayton Powell tried to sponsor some of this legislation. And uh, then he would make arguments about how, for instance, look, uh, he would attach amendments <laughs> to uh, legislation like for housing and for uh, for schools, basically saying, you know, how can you use the the, the tax money of African Americans to um, to uh, 
to, to against them for, through segregation and so on, right? So I'm trying to improvise the end of this. And basically, though, in, in, uh, when, when, the, uh, when the Democratic Party went left of center to defeat the Progressive Party, only then to shift back to the right and oppose civil rights legislation, in, uh, from 1949 to 1950, Mark Antonio's speeches focused on less on the Southern Democrats and more on the hypocrisy of uh, the Northern congressmen. So, and those, th these three dramatizations are actually from 1950, where Mark Antonio, <coughs> the clock is really ticking on Mark Antonio. The political parties are starting to gang up against him. And uh, I, so I, so I chose these three uh, moments where Mark Antonio is, uh, Mark Antonio, uh, it, it, at least in two of those dramatizations, speaks out against uh, northern hypocrisy. So in the interest of time, I will, um, I will cut my presentation short. There are, other, there are other elements of the presentation that were from two years ago, so you should look it up on YouTube. <laughs> so um, hold on, let me, get this, uh, let me get myself ready here. Give me a moment, sir. Okay, got it. I'm ready for you. Okay, from January 21st, 1950. Well, 1950. In the first dramatization, Mark Antonio responds to Congressman Key's charge that the dismantling of Jim Crow was communistic and insists on a complete end to it. The gentleman, Mr. Keefe, infers that it is communism to insist as I have been insisting that there must be an end to Jim Crow, that you could never solve this problem by degrees, by gradualism. The Negro people have waited too long and have suffered too much under Jim Crow to wait for the success of gradualistic solutions. He implies that I am intolerant. I am intolerant. I am intolerant for anyone who would tolerate conditions of segregation and Jim Crow. I am intolerant of inequality. I am intolerant of those Jim Crow conditions and I shall continue to do all that I can in my limited capacity to destroy them. So if that is intolerance, if it is communistic, as the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Keefe, would call it, then all I can say about it is that I accept that charge and I do so with pride. I am not for 50% equality. I am not for 90% equality, because anything less than 100% equality is not equality. There is only one kind of equality, I say to the gentleman from Wisconsin, and that is 100% full equality. Call it communism, call it what you please, but that is the only solution to this problem. You did not free the Negro if you did not give him the full equality and the wherewithal with which to live. It was proposed right here in this house by Thaddeus Stevens that every emancipated slave be given 40 acres and a mule, a 40 acre farm and a mule. It would have, it would have meant breaking up the big land feudalism of over 200 acres. Radicalism, is it not? What is this business you are perpetuating? Do you want to deal with that system gradually, or do you want to temporize with it? Thank you. In the second dramatization from April 26, 1950, it underscores the importance of amendments to bills that ensure the desegregation of institutions. He then reprimands Northern congressmen for, 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 for their for, hypocrisy. For, for their hypocrisy. All right, I'm going to get out of character and just to. to <laughs> you all set? Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, this amendment prohibiting segregation in all educational institutions receiving federal aid is an important amendment. It is offered in a sincere endeavor to bring about results in a situation which is crying out in this nation for results everywhere in the country. This Congress must be judged by the status of civil rights in the nation. It must be judged by its records on civil rights. 
As a matter of history, the character of any period of any institution must be judged by the status of civil rights. As long as oppression of the Negro continues, aided and abetted by government, then that government is retrogressive and a reactionary government. I am shocked and I think the American people are shocked at the neglect, the indifference, the callous indifference with which this Congress has been dealing with this subject. The majority of this Congress was elected on the Pledge of Civil Rights Enactment. There are no more than about 110 members who come from below the Mason-Dixon line. They do not constitute a majority in this House. That is a mathematical fact. Yet we have not been able to pass a single piece of civil rights legislation. Every time an amendment of this character is offered in the Committee of the Whole, what happens? Only last week I offered a similar amendment with respect to the desegregation of the District of Columbia. I noted what happened on the vote on that amendment. 50% of the members present remained in their seats and did not vote. The Dixiecrats, the Dixie Democrats, did not remain in their seats. They voted. They voted against the amendment. They voted in accordance with the manner in which they campaigned. They campaigned against civil rights and they voted against civil rights. Yet, the minority becomes the majority in this House because the majority, which campaigned on the proposition that if elected, it would enact civil rights legislation, is reneging, reneging on its campaign pledges. How do you justify it? You cannot put up the straight rights argument on this one. You are taking federal funds, and when you take federal funds, you take those federal funds subject to the conditions under which government gives you those funds. The federal government has a right to say to the recipient states or institutions how these funds are to be spent. This is supposed to be a civil rights Congress. I am calling on this Congress to say to the states and to the institutions, the recipients of these funds, look, you cannot spend this money for the purposes of segregation or discrimination in jobs or in employment. <laughs> You cannot answer this argument except by asserting the racist arrogance of white supremacy. That is the only basis upon which you can vote against this amendment. Honesty, morality, decency, and yes, the Constitution require that this House adopt this amendment. Thank you. On May 10, 1950, Mark Antonio responds to the difference between his desegregation bill versus that of New York colleague Congressman Jacob Javits. And I'm going to play the I'm going to play the role of, of Jacob Javits. I just wanted to be sure we have the effects of these amendments clear. My amendment applied applied to colleges and universities and the federal money is devoted to that purpose. The gentleman's amendment covered all the money in the bill. That is right. The gentleman's amendment is a very limited civil rights amendment. The gentleman, Mr. Javits, is very limited in his approach to civil rights, and my approach is sweeping. My <coughs> bill forbids all discrimination in any institution accepting federal aid, whereas Mr. Javits's amendment prohibited discrimination only in colleges and universities accepting federal funds. I want full civil rights. I admit the difference, and I think our records in this House will bear out the difference. Now, with my amendment, you have another chance to keep faith with the people. I know it is annoying to you when I offer these amendments. <laughs> I know a lot of people are annoyed and disgusted that Mark Antonio should be, should be repeatedly offering these civil rights amendments, but I am going to keep on offering them as long as I am here and until we win this fight. Because I conscientiously believe, and it has been my guiding principle, my political philosophy, that no white man in America is free as long as the Negro is subjected to discrimination and Jim Crow and segregation. 
There can be no freedom and no democracy in any land where men and women are deprived of equality because of the color of their skins or their national origins or their place of birth or the church in which they worship. I know this principle is a challenge to white supremacy, but white supremacy has to be challenged and it has to be beaten, otherwise our democracy can never live. It is a mere mockery, it is a sham, it is a fraud. Sure, you can wave the flag all you want, you can red bait all you want, you can raise the red bogey all you want. But as long as men are deprived of equality and of their God-given rights by means of Jim Crow and white supremacy, so long we will not have any genuine, real freedom, real equality, real democracy in these United States. Now is the chance to strike a blow against white supremacy by adopting this amendment. Thank you. Yeah, I'll like vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I'll vote for you. Oh, thank you. So now I'm going to introduce our uh, next presenter, Gerald Meyer, who's a, a, a co chair of the Vito Marco Antonio Founder. He's also a founding member of the faculty of Ostos Community College. He's authored. Vito Marcantonio, radical politician, co-edited co The Lost World of Italian-American radicalism, radicalism, and has had published over 70 articles and reviews on a wide range of subjects. Professor Meyer serves on the editorial boards of Socialism and Democracy in Science and Society, appears in documentaries, reviews, manuscripts or publications, and lectures widely. Hi, everybody. Well, Dr. It's so good to, Thank you. to hear you. It's wonderful. Uh, you know, just a couple of odds and ends to start with, uh, uh, not in any particular order, but uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience for me personally, and I know for others, that we have the Vito Mark Antonio uh, Forum. It's three and a half years. Uh, we're 20 people. And uh, 14 public meetings. This is the 14, and all I think really successful. And from the beginning, the idea was that members would, if, if they wanted to, uh, pick up a project having to do with Mark Antonio. Well, Roberto became Mark Antonio. So yeah. this is this is really More as figure. good as it gets. Right. You know, I mean, it can't get better than that. But. Uh, but, but Dave, uh, Dave Giulio is started to do the uh, videos. So we now have a whole menu of 15 at least uh, videos, maybe 20 probably, uh, documenting <coughs> our work, uh, beautifully edited by Dave. And I want to thank him and give him a He's the guy behind the, you know, the camera there. You know, we should get a camera for him. You know, good-looking guy and all that. <laughs> so uh, thank you. And uh, Gil started to write poetry about Mark Antonio. The litany goes right through me. You know, my whole life is about coming out of closets. You know, I think the first one was that my grandmother was Jewish. That was a big one. <laughs> then another was that I was an alcoholic. You know, <laughs> falling down drunk. That was another one. You know. The hardest one, I thought, was about being gay, you know, like everybody, like they knew already, you know, but anyway, that, <laughs> so then that one, I mean, it's just endless numbers of closets. Well, the last one is I'm half Irish. I want you to know something. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hardest one of all. And they're connected to every one of the others, I want you to know. So, I mean, you know, when I heard, you know, when, uh, when James Joyce said, the Irish are a priest-ridden, God-forsaken race. I said, Amen. <laughs> but anyway, no I'm. More. No more. You know, I mean, there was one good thing about it. You know, we 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 grew up this most dank, reactionary uh, kind of uh, atmosphere. Church of uh, you know, heavy-handed the church and lots of alcohol, and uh, yet everybody knew the revolutionary songs. From uh, and it was such an odd thing uh, that we had that. 
and we knew about the Catholic worker. It's interesting. So there was something there, and when the, I, I did it early, but a lot of people followed. And when I, uh, originally, you, if you were on time for church, you couldn't get in. They were flowing out over the into the the stairs, and within ten years, they were rattling around. You know, even for Palm Sunday. You know, so quite a change. But when I hear Gil, uh, the litany, they were dragging us that we were Lubavitcher Catholics. You know what I mean? It was like, <laughs> nobody, nobody has written about this. You know, some of you understand and that can relate. But, uh, but it was just amazing. We were, and it was just so boring. It was maddeningly boring, you know? And it was all in Latin. They didn't teach us Latin. I mean, it's like, you know, Gloria can play dominoes better than you can. No, she can't. And just like, oh my God. You know, just, it was just made, this was also had a lot to do with the alcohol, you know, and other things. And the sexual acting out and everything else. It was just so maddening. Work. But in any case, what did I like? One of the very, I never told you this. Yet. One of the very few aspects of this whole thing that I liked was the litanies. Hmm. You know, Mary, Virgin of the Pray for us. But it was like, you know, Sufi. This was more like Sufi Catholicism. Pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us. Oh, my God. All of a sudden, like, you were really, like, could levitate. Like, oh, you know. Pray for us. Pray for us. You know, then it would go back, you know, to the boredom and all the rest of it. The nuns liked to punish me by making me sit with the girls. They were totally clueless. But in any case, so much for that. But... But I wanted to mention, thank you for being able to help me get out, uh, come out of that closet today. The, uh, uh, I think just a couple of other uh, odds and ends. You know, in preparing for the talk, it's such a rich topic. I, you keep finding more and more material, more and more stuff to look at. It's, because it's, it's just an astounding conundrum. I'm so glad I've, I've gotten involved with this. This is my mission, you know. Wendell Phillips, the great abolitionist, um, he, he was apparently a pretty happy guy, satisfied guy. And very late in life, somebody said, what's, what's the secret of your happiness? He said, how can, how can somebody be happy like you and have a happy life? He goes, adopt an unpopular cause and stick with it. So in any case, this, <laughs> this is one of my <laughs> unpopular causes. But but I, I really um, fell in love with Mark Antonio and everything that's about him. And, but it's so, there's a fascination. You know, we have 435 congressmen, you know, in the United States Congress, two-year terms. If we would estimate that on average they might serve three terms, Mark Antonio served seven. Um, but let's say the average was 30. I, I, I once did the math on that. If you went from, you know, from Mark's time to now, you know, from the first time he was elected in '34 until the last session, I knew something like 7,000 congressmen served. And here we have a congressman uh, who there are three biographies. There's, a, in a sense, a biography. Uh, Annette called this a partial political biography. She's a smart lady. She knew him very well. Annette uh, hosted uh, the last birthday party for Mark Antonio in her, in her parlor. In my mind, her living room was as big as I don't know, a basilica, and it was smaller than anybody. You know, it was a, a little L-shaped room, just filled with with everything. Denied access, she created a salon up for the left, and during the darkest years, what a wonderful, wonderful woman! You really want this book. The uh, so uh, Roberto and I helped get this uh, this reprinted. This is the second edition. And it has advantages because I wrote a little biography of Annette that's in here. There's a bibliography. There's a new introduction. It's 10 bucks. What a steal. Now, uh, but the Judiciary Committee. How, but, but going back a little bit to the importance of Mark Antonio as a congressman, there really is, um, there are so few congressmen that find their way into history at all. One of the few is Thaddeus Stevens. And somehow, uh, if I uh, would pick one congressman most similar to Mark Antonio, it would be Thaddeus Stevens, for sure. And, uh, and both of them have been denied their place in history, have almost nothing named after them, 
I mean, I, I remember in, in grammar school they mentioned uh, the, not Daddy Stevens' name, but the 40 acres of the mule as something amusing, as a joke, mm -hmm. a type of a, a joke. Well, it wasn't a joke. That was the solution. Mm -hmm. And that, was the, that would have been the basis mm -hmm. uh, to, to break uh, white supremacy in this country, and it failed because it gave an economic basis for equality, radical republicanism. So it, it's just extraordinary. And, and yet, although Mark and Tony has received more attention than certainly most uh, congressmen, it's not enough because he's utterly, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and I think we're getting a, an, a, a sense of this, uh, you know, with Roberto's wonderful summary of his career and, and the dramatizations to really get a sense of his importance. <coughs> and there's so many different areas where he's important. Uh, I think he is the single most uh, consistent and articulate defender of the foreign born. I don't think we've ever had another in this whole history of the country where he came from an immigrant family, lived in an immigrant community, and took up the cause of the foreign born. There's no one. There's no one today. There's no one else that comes to mind. Absolutely no one. There, there, there are congressmen <coughs> speeches and whatever else, but th that he made that part of his life's work to advocate for the immigrants uh, as the, in a sense, the most defenseless people of all. And, and, to, and to see and to work that into a wider picture. This is what interests me, is that all of this is woven together into a, a, an ideology with a, uh, uh, a, an attached, integrated politics. So you have the principles and you have the politics intertwining in a very, in a dialectical way. And that, you know, in Marxism, nothing, in, is me nothing exists without agency. There are no sentences without subjects to the sentence. There's no passive voice. If something's gonna happen, somebody's gonna have to do it, or it can't happen, and it's not ready. It's not really discussed. You don't, you know, you, you, you dis Marx said, the problem only exists when the solution arrives. Uh, and, and I think, think about our personal lives, the closets, same. So, so with, with the, the, the solution, it's, it's, it's not just the problem, it's the solution, and they're together, and finding ways to break through. And I'm, I am endlessly admirable for Mark Antonio. Most leftists are windbags. They're just windbags. It's just embarrassing. It's ultimately embarrassing, I'm telling you. You know, like I sometimes, you know, I'd rather say I belong to some strange religion. I won't mention any names, you know. I like them better, I really do. You know, if you want to be, have a happy life, move next to a Jehovah Witness. I'm telling you, it's really, really, they'll be, they're just wonderful. They make casseroles, you know, they, they're, 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 you know, they play music loud, they discipline their children. I have this beautiful house in, in Park Slope. I'll, I'll, I'll move, you're under the Williamsburg Bridge, where I'll, I'll trade. <laughs> now the family moved in with a trampoline, you know. They can't afford a nanny, they got a trampoline. It has ruined my life. I mean, you know, I have no great sense of entitlement, but it's just absolutely ruined my life. So, but, but I think what happens with, uh, you know, with, with Mark Antonio, and I think with what he's attached to, because he's a man, but he's embedded in a culture. He's embedded in a political culture, which has a social basis. He's really, a pro-communist. Yeah. He's not a member of the Communist Party. He's pro-communist. That's hard to say. Still, it's hard to say. But that is the fact. That's what he is. He's somebody that can't see his political goals be achieved without the Communist Party. And he was right. By the way, look what happened. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, and he works with them, and they work with him. He becomes a spokesman for their politics for an, on a national basis. They're, again, except for Thaddeus Stevens, who represents an ideological, the ideology of radical republicanism, which we really must go back and look at, we, and, and to read W.B. Du Bois's uh, you know, Black Reconstruction, and to really look at Eric Foner, which is a little bit diluted, but still very, very good. 
Um, and to look at radical, the, the period of radical reconstruction is very inspiring, where there was a politics that said you cannot have a political solution without an economic solution. If there is not an economic rearrangement in the South, equality for black people will not occur. And the fight has to be on that basis. And then attached to questions of politics, this isn't just a theoretical idea, somebody writing a paper about it, it had to do with how do you then uh, bring that about? How do you implement that? And uh, it had everything to do with voting, it had to do with political parties, it had to do with organization, it had to do with uh, uh, democracy, radical democracy. Which so, so for the first time in America, there, were pub there was a public school system in the South, for example. It had to do uh, with uh, finding political spokespeople, representatives that could articulate for the people, to organize the people, and to implement uh, the, uh, as much as possible of the dismantling of the economic basis for the slaveocracy, which was the plantations. As long as the plantations remained intact, <coughs> it was inevitable that they would return to, politi to political power, and they did. But before they did, they smashed everything. And it, I believe it's really the first example of fascism with what occurred. You know, the destruction of radical republicanism by the Ku Klux Klan uh, with the collaboration of the northern capitalists so they could resume political power. That's really the first example uh, of fascism uh, the use of terror, you know, to terrorize uh, the black people and their white supporters uh, into uh, subject subjugation, uh, the introduction of mass lynchings and uh, all kinds of humiliations and burnings and pogroms uh, against, uh, you know, white people uh, uh, and, uh, and the black people uh, fighting for democracy in the South. And they won. And, and it all deteriorated after that, going down, down, down. Part of that deterioration was the introduction of poll tax, because they had to undo Reconstruction. Now, how do you do it? Uh, you, we had the, the Reconstruction Amendments, you know, the 13th, 14th, uh, 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 the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 15th Amendment really, uh, the 13th Amendment re, uh, really happened. You know, it already it happened. The, the slaves were freed by the Civil War, but it, it's not inconsequential that something is codified because it can be taken away, you know, so you want that. We've got to be careful. All this ultra left is, is we've got to fight that. It's just awful. It's just dreadful. It boxes us in. It puts us in a corner. We're isolated. We start fighting because nobody's listening. You know, it's just dreadful stuff. But so, so it is important. Law is important. It's, everything's important. Everything's important. Doesn't mean everything is equally important at every time, but everything's important, you know. Lenin, what do you have to do to be a communist? Number one, know everything. Close the books, I'm on. <laughs> no, anyway, no. Anyway, but, but we have to know everything. But no, we have to know everything. So, so with uh, the poll tax, and it was not introduced right away, the unraveling of black reconstruction took place over a remarkable long period of time. So uh, the, the same way with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of socialism, the unraveling of that continues as we speak in China now, the privatization of what's left. Now what's occurring is the unraveling of social democracy. That's what we're witnessing everywhere. Social democracy is now unraveling. That's what's occurring. It takes time. They take their time when they can. They have a strategy. They have a plan. They enact it. They're not bullshitting. They're in an odd way more principled, our enemies. In an odd way, they're more principled than we are. That's a hard one to swallow, but I think it's true. The, uh, but, but with Mark Antonio, I think these are highly principled people. They're willing to take losses. They dedicate their lives to this. He didn't have children. That was very common. No children, one child. This is it. This is what they're going to do. They, they know that their chances of winning are not very high most of the time. And they're willing to take their losses, and they mobilize themselves to do the best they can. And that's what he did. And he died at 51. His heart burst. You know, so, you know, this is what it is. But it's hard. 
this is all very hard. It's hard stuff. But what uh, in going through uh, some of my, you know, some of this material, so I could try to say something a little new and something that would help me look at this better too, is uh, I think <coughs> what struck me is a lot of what Roberto was talking about was the strategic aspect of it. It interests me very, very much. Is that there's a large picture that they're working with, and they're not doing everything at the same time. It, uh, you know, it, things develop in stages. There's a certain kind of a discipline in it. So it's very striking that in the the, the early period of um, the early period of the Great Depression, uh, you know, in the 30s, there is very little that is specifically uh, for African American people. The idea is to get the New Deal program through, and that those the poorest people will benefit the most, by far. And the key is to get that through. And then to organize those people together into organizations, specifically industrial unions. So there's, there's a, a project of finding ways uh, to maximize uh, your side, the forces on your side. This a lot has to do with the, the popular front. And the thinking of the public, everyone should read The United Front by George uh, Dimitrov. Uh, and uh, it, it's just, it's really all there. Uh, the, uh, what was clear by 1935 is that the Russian Revolution was the only revolution that succeeded. And it had succeeded under most e extreme, unusual circumstances. It was going through my mind this weekend, something that's never mentioned. One of the reasons why it succeeded was that you had the Russian Empire. Then you had the German Empire, Central Powers, and you had the Allies. Well, the, the Central Powers and the, the Germans have been defeated, but they were still there. So the Allies couldn't get to, uh, to, to Russia to undo it. It took two <coughs> years before they, the intervention. So before they could, they could land there, including the United States, there were American troops, there were American troops that went all the way to Lake Baikal. We had occupied Vladivostok, for God's sakes. There were 14 countries that, that invaded Russia, but it was two years after. So they had consolidated the center and were able to survive. I mean, it, it, it was miraculous, <laughs> just miraculous. And there wasn't another, there was no other victory, no other victory. However, in the, in the interim, fascism was gaining everywhere, everywhere. And then with uh, Hitler's coming to power, you start counting the chickens, it was an impossible situation. And then everything was put into defending the Spanish Republic, and that failed. It was, it was impossible. Uh, France was now in between two fascist countries. Who was going to fight? Where? Scandinavia? Switzerland? There was no, nothing left. There was nothing left. It, so Dimitrov, they start to think. And it's all really in, in Mark Antonio, imbibes this, he imbibes this uh, from the popular front and, uh, and is able to uh, in digest this and incorporate this into himself and his uh, speaking, his thinking, and his politics together with, I think, the Communist Party to figure out how can you move under these conditions. And uh, in the popular front, one thing is to find allies. How do you reach out past the, co the working class, the, the industrial working class, the people that are most likely to accept communism? How do you reach out past the miners, industrial workers, that uh, in theory and in practice would be most uh, amenable uh, to, uh, to communism? How do you get past, how do you get beyond <coughs> that? And with Lenin, it was the peasants to move toward the peasants and to organize them. But so there was some of that in America, but that was very hard to do. But I think it then becomes they, they had the, the understanding that, that it was necessary to win over some parts of the middle class, that if some parts of the middle class were not won over, there would be no possibility of winning. And how do you do that? Many different ways. But one way was very interesting, was to make claims for the nation as a whole. To re that 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 the, now the the movement, not called the communist movement, but the, the the United Front, is now going to represent the best of the country, its best hopes, 
its best history, its best future. And a lot of that goes back then into rereading the history of the country to identify the progressive, uh, uh, the progressive <coughs> traditions within the country itself. That if the whole country is hopelessly reactionary, there's never been any successes, there's never been any victories, it can't happen probably. So, so it's a question of, of identifying what is it in American history what is it that, that one could now begin to build uh, a movement based not on Russia, not on, on uh, somewhere else, uh, in the United States? Now, some of this is a bit torture, frankly, I think, that can happen. But, you know, we all do that one way or the other, you know, but, but, but it was for a good cause. And to, and to some extent, it wasn't entirely wrong. So it's what you find Mark and Tony doing is appealing to American history. That very early in his first term to go to, like when uh, trying to uh, argue in favor of uh, expanding the membership of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had declared the New Deal unconstitutional. Here we are in the middle of a depression. There were measures put into, into, uh, uh, you know, into practice, national recovery <coughs> and the uh, Agriculture Administration Act, which uh, did uh, save people's lives. I once asked my mother, I said, Mom, why do you always vote Democrat? She said, because I was working for 40 hours a week for $20 a week, and when Roosevelt came in, I was working 30 hours a week for $20 a week. That's it. I once asked her, why do you still go to church? She said, during the Depression, I don't want to get upset. She said that uh, during the Depression, when we didn't have any food, we went to the church. We knocked on the door and they gave us $20. And we could do that. We knew that we could do that. That's what it's about. This is what it's about. Can you, can you do something for somebody? Can you <coughs> actually meet somebody's need? Their present <coughs> immediate need while you're, while you're organizing people towards some larger solution. But there has to be something that occurs uh, uh, with that, you know. And I think this was <coughs> the organization of unions, the organization of the sharecroppers, the organizations of tenants' leagues, and also caring for people's spiritual and cultural needs. That this movement was a cultural pluralist movement, which believed that, that the, the immigrants had a right to their own cultures and their languages, and that it was a political act of interest to everybody <coughs> that, uh, that the cultures and the languages be preserved. And all of this was incorporated into their political work. I knew people years ago, communists, that they were told to go and learn Croatian. I knew people that were told to learn Yiddish to, 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 and Spanish. You had to learn the <coughs> language, not run away from it. You know, and to uh, and every nationality, except the Irish, every nationality, <laughs> there was, uh, you know, I mean, really, you know, it's hard, you know, it's a hard, it's hard to love your own sometimes. But you know, you know too much, you know too much, that's the problem. So, so the, the, the point is that, you know, this was some different kind of a movement. What happens with Mark Antonio is he appeals to this history. When, when, when the, when the, the <coughs> reactionaries backed by the Supreme Court now completely obliterate the, the New Deal, what, what Mark Antonio does is goes back into history to show that Lincoln had increased the number of, of uh, judges on the Supreme Court. There's nothing in the Constitution that says how many there should be. So you give a reason, you get more of them. I mean, what's the big deal? But he goes back to Lincoln and showed that Lincoln did that in the fight for uh, against slavery. <coughs> and today there was now a fight against the, the ruination of the American people, the American working class. And that, it, and that justified uh, the, uh, the, the, the acts of uh, Roosevelt. Now, I, I, I find it very important that you, know, you can see the, the, uh, the termination of Mark Antonio and that movement to uh, abolish the poll tax. The poll tax was not abolished until a constitutional amendment, the, 14th, uh, the 24th Amendment, 
in 19, uh, uh, 1966. That's when the poll tax was abolished. 24th Amendment in 1966, there were still five states in the United States where you had to pay to vote. Now, the Texas was one, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, I think Virginia, five. When Mark and Tony, when they were fighting here, there were eight. And some of it, to just the details, it's very interesting in the speeches, the information that was supplied, that in many of the, of the uh, poll tax states, it was cumulative. So you had to pay the fee going back to the last time you voted. And, and then if you were 21 and you didn't vote, but you started voting when you were 27, all the missed elections you had to pay the fees starting from when you were eligible to vote. Now all of this was directed against the sharecroppers and the tenant farmers. There were uh, 10 million uh, sharecroppers and tenant farmers who were white and 6 million African Americans. There were 16 million people in the United States of America, where this type of monetary barrier existed, how do you fight against this? Well, what I think, uh, what's so fa to me fascinating was the, uh, repeatedly now they're appealing to the war. They're saying, you're asking, you're, we're in this fight against fascism, we're in this fight against racism, we're in this fight for our lives, and we're sending American troops abroad to do this, and we have a situation where uh, people are denied a vote, and he said if you have an undemocratic ballot, you'll have an undemocratic representation. What representatives are now uh, entering into Congress as a result of this, uh, this practice? There were, he said there were all the people that opposed the war effort, all the most reactionary uh, figures in the Congress. So by having uh, the poll tax, uh, it is really uh, creating a political situation uh, which is to the advantage of the reactionaries and hurting the war effort because how can you ask in a reasonable way African Americans and poor whites for that matter to go and sacrifice themselves and their children and their loved ones and their husbands, whatever else, when they're denied the right to vote, the most fundamental right that, that, that one could imagine. And it's a powerful argument. And, and it's interesting, you know, we think about where to start a fight. Start a fight where you can win. It's a very good read, very good thing to do. And see where it goes. See where it goes. I mean, really, the fight for, for, the right, the for same-sex marriage is very good for gay people. But it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a frontal attack against patriarchy. There's no question about it. It completely unhinges patriarchy. It completely uh, legitimizes all other non-traditional relationships of single mothers raising their children, or whatever other arrangements might be. It, 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 it introduces enormous measures of personal liberty, and it moves people to the left. When gay people are in the closet, they're so reactionary, it's unbelievable. They're hiding, they're hiding everything. They're afraid of, of something slipping out, slipping out, slipping out. Once gays are out, they're organized, they are a natural ally of the, of the left, the left liberals. I'm not saying that that makes them into socialists, but, but we need allies, you know. Uh, like, you know, we have a marvelous way of alienating people, overlooking people, opposing everything, and not really seeing where is it, who's, I'd like to say, who's the next group over? Who are we targeting? Who are we trying to reach? Who are we trying to talk to? Who's amenable? to working together with us. And I think that Mark Antonio exemplified this ability to articulate a politics in a way that what he was saying could be heard. Notice, I think, uh, in the speech, is the connection of the fight for African Americans together with the foreign born, nationality, religion. There was huge amounts, huge amounts of discrimination against Jews and Italians. In, in that period, huge. But they're connected. You want to win this? We're in this together. And, and that's the job of the political leadership and a political movement. If you don't have a political leadership and a political movement, you can't have a strategy. You can't have a strategy. Everybody's doing what they want to do. Somebody wants to cook, uh, somebody wants to uh, 
grow parsnips, they grow parsnips. Somebody else wants to eat kale, they eat kale. And somebody wants to do it next year, and somebody thinks it's a better idea to fish. And, and, and there's no coordination, and time goes by, and they can wait. We can't wait. Or maybe we can wait. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's the problem, because we can wait. But the people that can't wait require a, a solution. And if we don't provide that solution, the church is around the corner, and the bar is around the other corner, and whatever else, and nothing ever changes. So I, it's not that Mark Antonio, it's not that there's a direct formula here. There isn't. But there's a, um, a sense of, of how to move things, how the left could win, how there's an opportunity for the left to win. Mark Antonio fought anti-communism in the most consistent, uh, explicit, and effective ways of anyone, anyone else. The communists never did it as well as he did it. They were all hiding. They were all hiding. Don't tell anybody you're a communist. So they, they would ask, what should we do if, if they say you're a communist? You know what the answer was? Lie. All the communists were told to lie. 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 There, there, there are some reasons for that, you know, but, but, but who told the truth? He told the truth. You know, he said Mussolini marched into Rome under the banner of anti communism. He said, I mean, he, he, nobody, he said, you want to you wanna win something easy? Attack a minority. That was his defense of the communists. So why are you doing this? Because you can get away with it. You know, it was perfect. And to, to really, to really identify, to, to prevent, to prevent uh, the severing of the most determined uh, and the most uh, articulate, the most ideologically, um, uh, you know, developed group from the masses of the people. That if you, if you, if they can sever, if they can sever uh, the communists from the masses, they, 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 they they're in power indefinitely forever. That's it. So, the, he, so you had to fight that. If you didn't, if you didn't fight, if you didn't fight anti-communism, there was no way of winning. You had to fight anti-communism. There's, there's nobody else like this guy. You know, uh, and, and there's another piece to it. I mean, I, I, I just wanted to wrap up because I, you know, I guess you could say I could go on quite long on this, you know. I mean, he's it's so, so wonderful. I, what I think, there's one fact that if somebody said, well, tell me one fact about Mark Antonio, you only can tell one fact, you know. I would say is that the, the fact I would like to report to you is that he lived and died within four blocks. That's the most important fact. Hey, look, if you're Lenin, you're Lenin. I have a friend, I call him the Lenin, I call him the Lenin of Hudson County. You know what I mean? It's like, you, I think you know some of these people. Lenin of Bensonhurst, the Lenin of, you know, whatever. You know, I mean, I've known quite a few. So, in any case, but if, you know, but, but if really, we all have some influence. Everyone. A prisoner in solitary has influence. There's no one in the world that doesn't have influence. You know, it depends what we, what we do. And to say, well, how do we have influence? Who do we have influence with? If you're moving all the time, you have influence with nobody. Nobody knows you. Who's going to know you? Neighbors? No neighbors. Uh, <coughs> associations? No association. Go to church? Church? <laughs> no, none of that. Nothing. There's nothing. You know nobody. Nobody knows you. Everything is based on how you feel. Feelings are not facts. Annette T. Rubenstein. She is a wonderful person. Annette said, she said that comradeship is better than friendship. She said friendships are, are based on emotions that come and go. She goes, what works is comradeship. Are two people not gazing into each other's eyes, but two people looking in the same direction. And there's a much greater possibility of those relationships surviving. 
because people are actually doing something together. They're creating a product. They're creating something palpable. They're materializing, in a sense, the emotions, and they need one another to do that. And she said the key is to turn comrades into friends and friends into comrades. Boy, did she know what she was doing. She did that without a husband. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's something here that's so valuable, in a sense, for us to learn about. Can we replicate all of this? I don't think we can. But I, I but this, but they, they won. That's why they were defeated. They were defeated because they won. We can't be defeated because we haven't won. That's why they were defeated. They won. That's why there was the repression, because they had so much. They did so much. Going back to the Judiciary Committee, which is really a remarkable story of how you have a congressman from the American Labor Party, the only congressman from the American Labor Party, young guy, he entered, he entered Congress, he was uh, 30, uh, 34, young guy. And now they're offering him <coughs> the chairmanship of the Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives, where all the civil rights legislation is going to come up. Can you imagine? Talk about being offered a, you know, the, you know, the steering wheel at an early age, five foot four. Anyway, he said he was five foot six, he was five foot four. Anyway, it's five foot four. So why did they do it? They did it because of the American Navy that the elections were 1944. And the election in 1944, Mark, uh, Roosevelt was going to have to run uh, for the fourth term. And, and uh, uh, for the third term, rather. And, and then, so, so for 30, I'm sorry, 32, 36, 40, it was the fourth term. He's going to run for the fourth term. And, the New Deal had moved very, very far to the left. It had moved very, very far to the left. You know that Roosevelt, during the war, proposed that there be no salary in the United States of America of more than $25,000. If that would have happened, we probably would have had socialism right there. It's amazing. That uh, Henry Wallace, the, the vice president, when Henry Luce from Time Magazine said, this is the century of the common man, Henry Wallace said, this is, when Henry Lewis said, this is the century of the, of the American century, uh, Henry Wallace said, no, this is the century of the common man. And that's why Aaron Copeland wrote the, uh, uh, the cantata to the common man, you know. Uh, so, and Roosevelt said that what we have to have is the four freedoms. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, Freedom from fear and freedom from want. And he said that what this country needs in its State of the Union address is we need a national health program. We need employment for every single able-bodied person. On and on and on. Henry Wallace said the Soviet Union needs political liberties and we need the economic freedoms of the Soviet Union. That was the people that ruled the United States of America. Well, there was a lot of pressure, as you might imagine, from that. And the key in New York for the, for the Democrats was they had the solid South. How were they going to win? And the belief was, it was largely true, the Republican Party was a hegemonic party until 32. Remember that only a couple of Democrats won it. So Cleveland and Wilson, I don't know who else, that's about it, right? I mean, between the Civil War and, and the Depression, it's unbelievable. Two Democrats, I think, right? Amazing. So how can the Democrats win? And the belief was the, the, the absolutely necessity was to win New York State. New York State had the most electoral votes at that time, can you imagine, the 43 electoral votes. And they had, they felt they knew they had to get New York, otherwise they couldn't possibly win. There were some other Catholic states, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and so on, and sometimes New Jersey. It was very difficult for them to, to get together enough electoral votes under common, ordinary uh, circumstances. And in New York, the American Labor Party, which Mark Antonio then becomes the chairman of, was, uh, won 15% of the vote. 
they couldn't trust the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was controlled by the old Tammany Hall leadership, Irish American, again, Irish American <coughs> leadership, very anti-communist, tied up with <coughs> ideological anti-communism, uh, anti-Semitic, pro-Franco, and, and very opposed to the left New Deal. So it was in 1944, it was the American Labor Party that ran Roosevelt's, uh, Roosevelt's campaign in New York State. He was in a, a cripple, just going to die shortly, and we, uh, went in an open air uh, convertible all the way from Brighton Beach all the way to uh, Fordham Road uh, in the rain. There were over two million people that came to see him. The American Labor Party did that. This is what it's about. How do you put this together? This is serious business. This isn't like, you know, uh, this isn't pageantry. This is not pageantry. This is like the real deal. I mean, you know, Annette loved to say, loved to quote Brecht, and she said, Brecht said, he goes, that a revolution is not for those who want it, but for those who need it. It's the job of people like ourselves at the left forum <coughs> to go to the people that need it. And, and we have resources, we have educations, we have knowledge, uh, we have skills, and to, in a comradely uh, way, offer what we can to help them organize and get what they desperately need. And in the process, we'll be able to, to do what Mark Antonio did in that moment of time, is challenge reaction and make progress for the, uh, for the American people. Thank you. Well, we have uh, a few minutes remaining. So people are welcome to ask questions or make comments. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't know. Can't help the acknowledging me. Yes, I don't right. know. Thank uh, you. First of all, thank you. Uh, as for states born Puerto Rican, my love affair with Marco Antonio uh, began recognizing what he uh, meant for Puerto Rican independence. In during the time that I was reading about him, I read that he met with, and I, I just wanted to see if anyone could speak to this, and I'm totally changing the subject from Puerto Rico to Du Bois. I heard that he met with Du Bois, A, with, within the lawyer, but also regarding some of the agenda stuff, and I didn't know if you could expand on that, if there was anything specific to that. There's a play now uh, being shown, it opened, it's called A Dangerous Man, uh, yeah, and it's by Amiri Baraka, and Amiri Baraka, was it? No, it's at the uh, it's at the uh, Castillo Theater on West Forty Second Street. Somebody handed these over. Awesome. I'll give you one. It's called, I think it's called a dangerous man, and uh, and the play uh, is organized. Uh, Baraka organized. Uh, Baraka joined the Communist Party here, the American Party here, uh, sometime in the seventies, and I think that might have been where he became more associated with, like you know, Mark Antonio and so on, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I turned, I turned off my pacemaker. You should have turned off. His <laughs> so you know, I mean, this is like, sir, you know. Dave, can you mute that? Or? And a, and a, and a, and a pacemaker defibrillator with three leads. So, so in any case, so, but uh, so we have we have dramatization and board bill here today. No other panel has that. <laughs> He's writing subtitles to what happened. Now, in any case, so, but, uh, so, but in any case, but the idea is that. Uh, well, Mark uh, Du Bois, uh, that Du Bois was like Mark Antonio. He was pro-communist. He became a communist, uh, but uh, but he was pro-communist. He was in that in that community, and a, a very important initiative. This would have been in 1951. It was during the Korean War, and the United States were threatening to use the atomic bomb against the Soviet Union and against China. Uh, using it when the, uh, when the North Koreans, backed by the Chinese, broke through and, uh, you know, the whole you know, American army with the uh, South Korean uh, allies, uh, you know, had to retreat all the way back past the, uh, the 39th parallel, uh, that uh, they, they, it was a question of where they would stop, you know, whether that would be it. 
So uh, the United States, uh, very important figures, MacArthur and so on, said that the, the United States would use the atomic bomb against China. We're the only country that ever used the atomic bomb, not once, twice. You know, we couldn't wait to see what happened. We had to like quick do here. Those two cities were the most Christian cities in Japan. People always forget that those were the centers of Christianity in Japan. I'd like to remember that. Anyway, they were also the two most intact cities. So uh, it was just devastating. It was not intended to win the war. It was intended to, to stop the, the, the Russians from go, go, going any further into Manchuria, which didn't stop them anyway. But, uh, but, the, but the, the idea is that uh, one effort was the so-called Stockholm Peace Petition. And uh, the, the world movement began a petition to get 100 million signatures uh, to, to ask the, uh, the governments of the world uh, not to be the first to use the atomic bomb. It obviously was directed against the United States, the only other country that had the atomic bomb and the only country that had threatened to use it. Uh, there were members of Truman's cabinet that said that they would use the atomic bomb against the Soviet Union. The foreign minister of Israel just said they might use the atomic bomb in Iran. Went totally un un unreported. Amazing. This was uh, two weeks ago. In any case, so they, so that was called the Stockholm Peace. That Du Bois uh, became uh, the co-director of the uh, I think it's called the American Peace Center, uh, which was the the organization <coughs> in the middle of the Korean War. To, to get signatures on this petition. There were two million signatures in that, in the worst period of the, of the repression of Americans that signed the petition, which is a great victory. He was 82 years old, of course, handcuffed and marched off to jail. So the amazing FBI. thing, amazing. Uh, and the charge against him was that he was an agent of a foreign government that by passing out this petition, this made him an agent because what he was advocating for was parallel to what the Soviet Union wanted, which was not to, not to die, which was what? That the atomic bomb not be dropped, can you imagine? Well, Mark Antonio, who was very good friend with uh, Du Bois, uh, took the case and before a judge, he, he just knocked, he knocked, the, knocked it out of the box. And he had other victories in court at a time when a court victory was almost unheard of. Mark Antonio was, uh, from 1938 until, uh, I think, until 46, he was the director of the International Labor Defense. And as head of the International Labor Defense, which was the Communist Party's <coughs> legal arm, uh, it had the greatest successes of, uh, get this, of winning freedom for the, uh, the lives of the Scottsboro Boys, the eight Scottsboro Boys that were uh, destined for execution, being, being uh, charged with the uh, rape of white, of white girls, two white girls. And uh, they saved Angela Herndon, uh, who was accused of sedition uh, because he helped organize an interracial uh, demonstration in Atlanta, Georgia, asking for uh, asking for worker wages. That was, the, that was the, the, the slogan, that either there'd be some support or that, they, or that work would be provided. And he was charged with sedition and was actually uh, had a capital case against him. Uh, the International Labor Defense provided the defense for the Puerto Rican nationalists. And uh, Mark Antonio was a co-attorney with uh, Hilberto Concepcion de Garcia. Uh, and and I, I think what's so important here is to keep all this in mind. We're talking about the House of Representatives. We're talking about the courts. We're talking about a political party, the American Labor Party. We're talking about unions, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. To win, all of this has to be in play. Everything has to be in play. Everything. And it has to be, in some way, interrelated with one another. In the case of the International Labor Defense, they took over the defense for Sacramento If they had been there from the beginning, I believe Sacramento Zetti wouldn't have been executed. The, the anarchists, uh, which, you know, Sacramento Zetti, you know they were anarchists, but the defense, after they had been jailed for four years 
the, they, didn't, they hadn't published anything in English. The Bulletino from the defense organization was still in Italian. They had made no outreach, no outreach at all past, uh, past the Italian community. The, the uh, international labor defense got in there and got an international movement, uh, but it was too late to save them. But, the, but with the international labor defense, and I think this goes into this very, wedges right into this, their position was, this goes to the anti-lynching uh, activities that Mark Antonio was involved with in Congress was the co conceptualization or reconceptualization, reconceptualization of lynching as a political crime. That 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 regardless of whatever the charge was against the individuals that were going to be lynched or were lynched, in every case lynching was a political case because the intention was not to punish an individual defendant, the intention was to terrorize the, uh, the African American people mm -hmm. into submission. That was the intention. That that it was not to it was not to punish uh, an individual, and therefore lynching had to be treated always as a political crime with a political movement. So in this case, just to just finish, just to give you an idea of the thinking here, Mark and Tony wasn't just marching around <coughs> outside the court. They did that, but in court. You had lawyers that knew what they were doing. And the combination of working the system as much as you possibly could and putting up the best possible case, the Rosenberg lawyers, he couldn't have done a closing on a, on a, on a duplex apartment. You know, I mean, they were doomed. They were doomed. The, uh, the, but you, you had to have both. But this is the difference, and I think there's some. Yes, I'm sorry. What's going on? No, no. I just, I was just curious, just to be provocative here. Why not? This Why is not really not just to be provocative. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's no, just no. a question. Excuse that, me. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for Mark Antonio. I'm curious, and I've never read anything about it. Was since you brought up the gay issue during during the same period, toward the end of Mark Antonio's life, let's say after the war through through his death. There was a parallel war against sort of deviants in America, right. uh, particularly gay, you know, gay people working in Washington, but also all over the country, among many others. So I'm curious, did he ever take stands against those things? Nobody did. I know, I, that's why I'm asking the question. Why would you expect it? I mean, but that's pulling something out of the air. I mean, something has to be organic. I mean, you can't have like a list, like you know, like like it's sort of like that gets very religious. It's not like this list. You start <laughs> checking it off. I mean, things are organic. They have to develop out of real situations. <clears throat> this isn't a polygon. This is like real life. This is the real deal. And and it's also a question of being effective. Uh, it was very interesting, you know, how it fast. What a character. He was going to go to jail for three months. He thought the whole world, like from the Pope to, to Stalin and everybody else, should help him, you know, the poor guy. <laughs> anyway, so, so, so he wrote Sean O'Casey, you know, to, to, I don't know, send a letter to wherever. And, and Sean O'Casey wrote back to Howard Fancy. He goes, I have very little influence. And my writing this letter will do nobody any good. He was right. It's, this is not about symbolic behavior. We're not talking symbolic behavior. Save your energy. Save your energy. Think about the Mormons. Have you heard the good word? Not interested. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. You know, don't start arguing with them about the good <coughs> word. You heard they don't want to hear it. <laughs> Can move on. You know, find who's interested. You know, I mean, this isn't a game. This is not a game. This is like the real deal. I mean, uh, if you're really in, in this, you get hurt. You're denied things. You're at risk, guaranteed. And if, you, if nothing's ever happened, you probably never did anything. I mean, you know, you can't, you, you can't play. It's not to play around with. So it, it's, um, yes, so and, yeah. And, and, and a lot of folks have been heard about Mark and everything he's done. But there was an AFP congressman from the Bronx, yes. Leo Isaacson, and very little is said about him. And uh, I was wondering if you could oh, just I make a I comment thank you about so much. Thank you so much. What's your name? My name is John Langrod, and I used to work in the Henry Wallace campaign. Oh, I thought, oh, well, thank so, you very so I knew some of the well, people. Well, you know, Isaac, I just wanted to mention, 
Leo Isaacson was the only congressman in the United States that was refused a passport. Uh, uh, he was refused a passport, an American passport. He was elected, elected by the majority of the people of his district in the East Bronx. And uh, he wanted to go to the, uh, the World Peace Conference in Paris. That's where Picasso's The Dove, you know, came from. And the United States wouldn't give a congressman elected by the American people a passport that he could attend the conference. This is what was going on in America in 1949, and it got worse. It got much worse soon. As soon as the Korean War started, in doing my research, like on a net and so on, it's amazing how much violence there was in New York City. It's, people, it's not written about. The amount of violence against leftists and communists was amazing. You know, uh, physical violence, it was just astounding. But, uh, you know, peak skill and so on, but, but very much closer to home, into the neighborhoods, breaking windows, uh, uh, trapping people in houses, like people that went to uh, Kansas, the ALP, they would be trapped, they were trapped in the house, they couldn't leave. I mean, you know, astounding things. Uh, you're breaking up any kind of rally and so on. But uh, with Isaacson, there was a special election in the East Bronx. And the East Bronx was the ideal, that, I mean, aside from East Hall, you couldn't have found a better, a better situation for the left, frankly. And uh, it was the East Bronx, not the South Bronx, really. It was the East Bronx, which were, uh, were very poor Jews. That's for like Vivian Gornick with a wonderful book, Atta false, uh, false Attachments and the Passion of American Communism. I love her, she's a great writer. She has a new book out. And Gornick said, her mother was a communist, she goes, when her, she goes, when my mother and her comrades sat down at the kitchen table, history sat down with them. Mm. <laughs> you wonder what the, the appeals were. But going back to Leo Isaacson, uh, which was in that district, Yiddish speaking, these were the houses without the elevators. You know, these were the Jews that lived in houses without elevators, you know. <laughs> these were all walk-ups. And uh, so with Isaacson, the Democrat, the Democrat, uh, nice to see you. the Democrat uh, got a judgeship. So now a vacancy appears. And with New York law, there had to be an election within, like, uh, election within 12 weeks something like that, very short period of time. So this again goes back to the ALP, the wonderful, wonderful thing of the ALP. The ALP had around 325 uh, headquarters in, in New York City. It's amazing, yeah. And what they did, they were year-round centers where people socialized. A friend of mine was Greek. They had for different nationalities. And she said, oh, my father was always went there. They, they had the Greek, the Greek, uh, ALP thing on 8th Avenue, it used to be the Greek area. And she goes, oh, what did they do? He said, oh, they, they just smoked a lot of cigarettes and played dominoes. I don't know, whatever, but, but in any case, there were Italian, Italian centers in, in the village and elsewhere. They would have cultural things, but they also help people, help people with their landlords, tenant, help them fill out their, uh, their tax returns, help them with immigration problems, and so on. This, again, is critical. If, if this is what Mark Antonio did, if, if we're in a situation where we're preaching a lot of, where I grew up, we used to call holy horseshit. <laughs> That's Irish, I suspect. We, where people are preaching holy horseshit, and they're not helping anybody. It's holy horseshit, and people catch it right away. They smell it. They smell it. Around a corner, they can smell it. It's, it's horseshit. So, so what happens? It's a special election. So what the American Labor Party could do is concentrate its forces there because Mark Antonio wasn't running. They had almost won on the Lower East Side, which uh, Johannes G. Uh, Steele. They had almost won in, in uh, Flatbush, again, a, 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 a special election. But that's what you can do when you have an organization. So they could go into the East Bronx, knock on the doors, and win. In the general election, Isaacson gets twice as many votes and loses. Why? Because the three other parties, Democrat, Republican, and to their everlasting disgrace, the Liberal Party get formed one candidate and defeated the candidate that got the most votes, Isaacson. One, two years later, 
they do the same thing to Mark and John. May I add something to this? Is that what Isaac said? Um, when Isaacson wins in a special election in 1947, he is, he is then taking very critical stances against uh, Truman's foreign policy. So you know how things are barometers of things to come, right? So if the elections were held in 1948 and Isaacson and Mark Antonio, let's stick with Isaacson. Isaacson was a barometer of, of Truman's foreign policy, right? If it was, if it was based on plurality, Right, he would have won the election, and that would have been a uh, that would have been a an indictment of Truman's foreign policy. But because the other political parties are all ganging up under one candidate, and their aggregate votes are more than than um, Isaacson, he loses, and then that becomes the foreshadow of Mark Antonio's loss. And the American Labor Party became so strong in the Bronx that for two elections, every single elected official was uh, co-endorsed Democratic Republican to stop the American Labor Party, which had become the second largest party. And their willingness to take those losses in order to, to defeat leftism, a leftist, uh, was, shows really what's going on here, you know? He was a great guy, Isaac. He was a terrific, very, but again, it's a very interesting thing. The candidates were attractive. He's a good looking guy. He could speak Yiddish. He could, he's a good looking guy. He a uh, neighborhood guy, and uh, you can see. I'm mean, reading, you know, uh, materials relating to, to this. They they ask for the the, the party says, oh, who are people of local prominence? It's interesting. They, they who's of local prominence? Somebody that you know uh, that if he's standing there, other people are around him. You know, you start with that. You know, and uh, I have a question, <laughs> and you must know this. <laughs> In the 1950 election, there were two ALP candidates in, in the House of Representatives. Why was Mark Antonio defeated? No, Isaacson had been defeated in, in 48. So Mark Antonio was the only one. Right. Huh? right but you said two uh, ALP, so Isaacson lost in 1948. Yes, so in 1950, there was only one was left, Mark Antonio. And why was he defeated? He was defeated because of the Wilson Pakula Act, more than anything else, which is still wrong. still on the on I the books. Can I just say can I answer your question? He was defeated, it was defeated, he was defeated primarily because of the Wilson Pakula Act. The Wilson Pakula Act was passed in nineteen forty seven. Still on the books. That under before the Wilson Pakula Act, that uh, that a candidate could run in any party. One or all. We have fusion. So there's fusion. So if you have fusion and all the votes of this, if, if a party endorses a candidate, uh, all those votes are, are tallied together. That's fusion. But why shouldn't the same thing exist then for the selection of the candidates? It's logical and it's democratic. The problem was is that Mark Antonio, especially, would enter all the primaries. And he always won at least one of the uh, major, major parties' uh, endorsements. And twice he won all of them. So he won ALP, Democrat, and Republican. He did that twice. But he always won at least one. So with the vote of the American Labor Party, which East Hall, East Hall, in El Barrio was the only, in, El, in, uh, in El Barrio was the only Area. Now the two guys that lived in that were going to find out. The bar was the only was the only neighborhood in New York where the ALP was the majority party. There were there were neighborhoods where periodically it was the majority party, but in a consistent way. And uh, out of the um, the twenty election districts that Wallace won in 1948, eight of them were in East Hall, six in uh, uh, in the Puerto Rican area, and two in the Italian area. But it was a bastion for the left. But so they had around at least a third of the vote, you know, uh, to start. With. So they only needed another 15 percent. That was it, and and he could win. And and the ALP wheeled and dealed, by the way, in, in order to make this happen too. You, know, you took losses here and you helped them out, and then did you recant it, whatever. But with the Wilson Pakula Act, you could only run in the primary of a party to which you were not a registered member only if you had the approval of the county committee, which is Tammany Hall. 
that wasn't going to happen. So now Mark Antonio had to run solely for the American Labor Party at a time when the American Labor Party was being shredded and attacked everywhere and, uh, uh, and being red baited out of existence. Now, miraculously, in a way, he won 40, uh, he won 41% uh, of the vote. He had won 37% in 48. But, but in that, but in, uh, but that was still a Democratic and Republican candidate. But in 50, you had a fusion candidate, Democratic, Republican, liberal, and Mark and Tony running solely for the American Labor Party, and he was defeated. It was trickery. Mark and Tony called the gang up. It was, uh, it was just, uh, just twisting and turning any sense of electoral fairness or democratic process uh, to destroy a good person, a wonderful voice uh, for, for us, really, for us and humanity. And all of that was lost and has never been recovered. The American Labor Party hasn't been recovered because six weeks after the, Dem the American Labor Party lost uh, its electoral status by not getting 50,000 votes, because many of them weren't counted. But in any case, they were denied that. Six weeks after that, the state legislature passed a law saying that no party in New York State could ever use the word American in this title. So they not only lost its legal status, it lost the possibility of gaining back its name to get back on the ballot. God bless America. Good to see you. I hope we see you again. Buy a book, buy a book. Make an author happy, buy a book.